um, when, I was, when we were in Mexico, I wanted to do some bucket list items uh, for my birthday. And one of those bucket list items that I wanted to do, I wanted to go fishing in the ocean. Has anybody ever done that before? On a boat, in the middle of the ocean, some of you are like, I'm good, that's like white people stuff, but it was awesome, like, I really enjoyed it, it was so much fun, um, so I was so excited to go fishing in the ocean, uh, so me and Mario and my brother-in-law Chris, we get to the location, we're driving over there, I'm, I'm so pumped about this experience, and then we get to the office, because you have to check in and all that stuff, and sign the waivers just in case the boat sinks, um, so we go straight to the office, and what we didn't realize was that there was a line. Like there was already some people waiting for their turn to check in. So as, I, as we get there, there was a lady that immediately called us out. And we get there, she's like, excuse me, we've been waiting here, the line's over there. Um, it was kind of like, why are you mad, bro? Like, this is vacation. Um, so we're like, no problem. So we go to the back of the line. But as we go to the back of the line, she continues to let the whole world know that um, it took her an hour and a half to drive from her hotel to the location because traffic was there. And, and what we like to call these people, we call them killjoys, right? Like, so like you're excited about something. You're like, this is going to be great. And then the killjoy hits. Right? Like, and every group of friends, every family kind of has a killjoy. So we're there and she's, she starts telling the whole world how traffic was terrible, how she had to take two flights to get from Montana to Mexico. And you know what the killjoy's favorite phrase is? This is ridiculous. Right? So like after everything, everything is ridiculous. And then how they're having to wait now and how it's expensive. And this is ridiculous. This should not be. And I look at Mario and I'm like, Bro, I, I'm praying she's not on her boat, man. Like, oh, please, Jesus, don't let this lady be on her boat. She might get pushed in. I don't know. But, but you know, we all experience something like this. There's always a killjoy in the group. The, the killjoy is the pessimist. Like, everything is negative. You don't view things as good. They are like what we like to call the vibe killers. They're, they're the Debbie Downer. They're the complainer of the group. It's like if our group of friends, if we're going dancing somewhere, the killjoy is the one that's like, it's so loud in here. Like, we need to ask the manager to turn it down. And I was like, maybe because it might be a nightclub or something. I don't know. <laughs> or like, if I'm excited to go to a restaurant and it's like, man, a brand new restaurant. I can't wait to try it out. The killjoy Joy will be the one that comes to the table and is like, oh my God, the traffic was so terrible to get here. And what are they wearing? Look at the manager. Like, I need to talk to somebody. Look, I ordered. Why are they taking so long on my food? They added a tomato. And I said, no tomatoes. My food is ruined. Like, oh, I, I need to talk to somebody because this is just ridiculous. The, oda the audacity that they had. This is ludicrous. I was like, do you even know what ludicrous means? <laughs> You know, like, so they start using words they don't know. They start whining and complaining, and it's just everything is an issue. And that's the problem. It's like the thing is, you have an expectation. You are excited about an experience. You want to try something out, but then there's that killjoy that, that as you're wanting to experience something amazing, that killjoy kind of looks at something from a different perspective. They spin it and they kind of ruin the experience a little bit because of what they're thinking about. And, and as I'm thinking about this, you know, I think sometimes in life we see children as killjoys. I was like, man, I'm, I'm ready to be like, go on in my life. I'm gonna get married and all of a sudden, like we're pregnant and it's like, oh man. Like, I'm going to have to put a pause on my career. I'm going to have to put a pause on stuff. And, and oh, it's just going to, like, I can't go out anymore. And I'm, my sleep schedule is going to be off. And I'm going to get gray hair now. And it's going to be bad. And, and it, the, the thing is, we need to stop looking at kids as killjoys and start understanding that children are a gift from God. They are a treasure from the Lord, regardless of the situation. If you think about kids, if you think about pregnancy, like that is a miracle from the Lord, how God has sovereignly is allowing this to happen. If you think of the science behind it, where the sperm and the egg, how all that comes together, all of this happens because God allows it to happen. It's this amazing miracle, and children are treasure from God. They are not killjoys of life. 
And, and I wonder if we were to change our perspective on how we view and raise our kids, because God has a huge purpose for them. And their purpose involves us as parents. Now, I know some of you already checked out. Well, Ricky, I don't have no kids. I don't want no kids. I, that's not me. Well, you have a really big and important role as well because you have a church family that has kids. And you play a vital role in raising kids. You know, there's a passage. Look, at, um, It's going to be on the screen. And I'm going to speed through some things just for time's sake. Um, so in Psalms 127, verses 3 through 6, you know, David tells us, the author tells us, he says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. See, what he's saying is like children are a heritage. They are a, a gift from God. They're a good thing, but there's a responsibility of us raising kids. And we need to stop seeing kids as burdens and start seeing kids as a gift from the Lord. So with a gift comes responsibility. So I want to look at how, because of God's role for children, what does the word tell us as parents, as people of God, on raising these children, managing this gift, this treasure that God has given us? Even if those that don't have, we still have a responsibility as a church to, to take care and raise our kids right. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to look at five verses. This is a, a text that um, many people are familiar with, but it has some pretty important implications uh, that the author has. So like I said, we're on page 180, chapter 6. So the chapter is the, the big number. The verse is the little, tiny number. You know, make sure you're in the right place. Don't be like in Revelation trying to fake it. You know, ask for some help. This is what the word of the Lord says. I'm going to read it and then we're just going to walk through it. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be put on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So let's kind of see what, what we're talking about. So when we see kids, God's role for children involves you as parents and adults. So we, God has given us the, these gifts, the, the gift of a child, the gift of kids. So we start off in verse 4, and, and it begins, Hear, O Israel. So the word here, or this passage, four, um, 6 through 9, this is what is, I'm sorry, 4 through 9, this is known as the Shema. Um, this is something that, that the Orthodox Jews would use, and they, they pretty much recite this twice daily. Um, especially if you're a devout Jewish person. They also recite 11, 13 through 21, and then they recite Numbers 15, 37 through 41, which is kind of a blessing. It's like a benediction. So they begin, hear, O Israel. So the word Shema in Hebrew actually means to hear. So this is something that needs to be heard to the people of God by God. And it says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. This verse 4 is so important. It's vital to the word of God. This is, this is, a, this is a big time verse. Hear, O Israel. So the people of God, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You see, so there's a truth here that there's this monotheism. Like there's only one God. There's only one true God amongst all these other gods, little g. So if it's not the one true God, then all the other gods... They, they, they're, not a, they're not important. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. Like we have one true God and the true God is, is one. And he's pointing that our God is the Lord alone. It's his name, Yahweh. Um, 
Mostly it translates as the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You see, and I love that word one because if you look at, if you do some word studies, the word one in this passage does not mean, it's not a singleness. The word one in this passage actually means unity. And it uses the same word as Genesis 2, 24. When he talks about man and um, husband and wife becoming one flesh. You see, so there's two that become one. And what this verse is pointing out is like the Lord is one. It is talking about the Trinity as well. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one together. So it is pointing out the deity of God and how there is only one God, but is not excluding the concept of the Trinity. So the Lord is one. That means unity. It's together. There's only one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to verse 5. So what is the derivative here? What is the command that is being given here? It says it in verse 5. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. So the author mentions these three things. Because this means that you are to your whole being, your whole life, your whole heart, your whole soul is to love that the Lord is one, all three, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, all together as one. And then look at verse 6. These commands that I give to you today are to be put on your hearts. So that's big. So the commands that they have been given are to be put on your heart. So you're to meditate on these commands. You're to think about these commands. And why does he say they're to be put on your hearts? You know, the word um, Psalms 119.11, for I've hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. God is saying these are to be put on your heart. And you got to remember, this is the old covenant. What's coming the new covenant, when Jesus shows up, Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. So to have God's word written in your heart, for you to take to God's word to heart, is actually extremely important because it's a characteristic of the new covenant that's coming. And we got to get this. And he's saying, you got to write this stuff on your heart. You got to meditate on it. This is not a bad thing. Like This should be part of your life. And then it gets, this is where it gets deep now. So he, he gives this derivative, this command to Israel. And he says, you are to have this, love God with all of your heart, soul, your whole being. The, the, the law of God is to be written on your heart. So you are to talk about it, to think about it, to meditate on it all the time. But then he doesn't just stop there. Look at verse 7. What does he tell us to do? Impress them on your who? Children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when, when you lie down and when you get back up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. So let's look at verse 7. This is really important. What I noticed in verse 7 that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit was the first word in that passage. It says to impress them on your children. It doesn't say to talk about them with your kids. It doesn't say to teach them to your kids. He uses the word impress. And I'm just starting to think like, why would he do that? Because the word impress means to, to make a mark or design. It's like using a stamp or a seal. It's to, to, to leave an imprint on something. So he's not just talking about talking to, about these things to your kids. There's an action that comes with the talking. That's how you impress something. So you're not just talking about it, you're being about it as well. So your life must match what you're telling your kids. And you know, I, I, I meet so many people and there's that joke that's like, oh, you have a pastor's kid, they're gonna go crazy. You know, they're gonna rebel. And, and your kids that are raised in the church are gonna go nuts and they're gonna do all these things. And I was like, listen, kids do not rebel because of obedience they be rebel because of hypocrisy because they're looking at mom and dad spending all their time and all their efforts in the things of the Lord but they're living a whole nother way in a, at home so why am I gonna do what they're telling me to do but it's not doing anything you see so 
when he's talking about impressing them on your kids, it's not just talking about it, but you also have to show them what that looks like. You are impressing it in their lives. And then he kind of gives us an example of what that looks like. Talk about it when they sit at home and when they walk along the road and when they lie down and when they get up. You are supposed to talk about the Lord. It, this is inside and outside of the home. This is as they're awake and as they're walking. This is not a one time a week thing. Right? Like our kids do not just learn about God on Sunday. As parents, as people with children, or you guys that are uncles and aunts and grandparents, this needs to be a normal conversation at home. This should just be like everything. It should be like breathing. But what we've done in our, in our society, because kids are a killjoy, we need our time and we need our things and, and we need our space and we want to do what we want to do. So we want to let somebody else or something else raise our kids. And what he's saying is like, no, it, 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 you better understand that whoever's watching your kids, raising your kids, understanding, you better understand that it is all about as they sit at home, as they walk along the road, as they lie down, as they get up. This is all the time. So we have the responsibilities of always teaching our kids the derivative that was given in verse 5, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Talk about it to your kids. Impress it on them. Show them how that works. And then I love this because it goes in, in verse 8. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Verse 9. Write them on the door frames of your households and on your gates. What does that mean in verse 8? Tie them as symbols. So actually in verse 8, this is, when this was written, this was actually um, kind of like me a metaphor. It was like to always have them on your foreheads. So what he's saying is that God's commands, God's word is in your mind. It is on your foreheads. You should always be thinking it and on your hands. So that way you should always be acting on it. And then what, late, years later, what the Jews ended up doing or more of the... Um, the, the Orthodox Jews, they actually, they literally took this to heart and they created these things, and I'm going to butcher this name. Um, they, they created these things called phylacteries. Phylacteries. There you go. It starts with a piece. Look at it. Yeah, phylacteries. Thank you, Will. Phylacteries. And these phylacteries were these little boxes that had the scripture in them. And even if you were to go to Jerusalem today, they still have it. So they put these little boxes of scripture and they take these leather thongs and they wrap it around their arms and then they also wrap it around your head. So they are literally doing, but in this passage, he's trying to convey the message that it's not just learning about it, but it's also doing it as well in your hands. And then in verse nine, write them on your door frames of your house and on your gates. That means that as you leave to go work or to go do whatever, tend the, 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 the cattle, the flock, it is there when you leave and it is there when you come back. So it's the first thing you see as you leave the house and it's the first thing you see as you come back to the house. AKA, this is a part of life. This is everywhere. You are to train your child all the time in the laws of the Lord. And then I love verse 10. Let's look at verse 10. And I love what it says. It says, and then when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you. And I love this right here. Watch this. A land with large flourishing cities that you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of goods, good things that you did not provide. Wells that you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant then you will eat and are satisfied but be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery then verse 13 fear the Lord your God serve him only and take the oaths in his name man so he just wants to make sure that you have the reminder that everything that has been given to you you didn't do. God is sovereign and his sovereignty allows things to happen. That's hard for us to understand because we use those terms in the good, but it's hard to use those terms in the bad. How like, man, God is sovereign. I got the job I want. Yes, praise the Lord. It's great. But what happens when like 
sickness hits or cancer or something terrible hits us. You know, God is big enough to be sovereign over that as well. And we have got to understand this. So he's allowing, letting the people know. And I truly believe so when we're looking at children, as we impress these things on our kids, we also have to show our kids when God is faithful. You talk about these things to your kids. Man, the Lord provided for us. He made a way out of no way. Man, God gave us this. Daddy got the job because God lined it up. Like, look at our house. God is the one who provided this house for us. Amen. When our kids do like amazing things, it's like, no, it's not daddy's work. It's not mommy's work. It is the Lord's work that is allowing this to happen. We have got to show our kids this. Because if not, then we're going to raise our egocentric kids, thinking that they're the ones that did everything when they did absolutely nothing. So what you do is when good things happen, whether good or bad, you defer it to God, the Lord, the one, and you point everything back to him. And you have got to teach your kids this. Because if not, your kids are going to grow up and they're going to think that they are the bee's knees. They're going to think that they are everything. They're, they're going to think that they're the ones that are able to do whatever they want. And they are not going to rely on the Lord and they're going to fail. So we have got to begin early on that it is not you. It is God that does it all. Now, three quick things from this passage that I want us to understand. So we have a responsibility to our kids as adults. And as parents, this is what the Lord says. Hear, O Israel, hear the people. Impress these things, the law of God, on your kids' hearts. Impress that on them. So there's three kid things that I, just reading the scriptures and on this uh, passage about our children that I want us to understand. Because I think sometimes we kind of push kids aside because of their age. And when the Bible talks about children, it's talking about conception all the way to adolescence. He's not talking about teenagers right now. He's talking about kids. And we also see this in the book of Proverbs um, as well. So it's important to understand that these are for kids. So real three quick things. Number one, kids are kingdom builders. Kids are kingdom builders. Kids do not belong on the sidelines. They belong in the game. You understand that? And we use kids sometimes as like they're too little, they're cute. You know, we might have them sing once or twice and see how they jack it all up. But, you know, that's like the best video, like, yeah. But at the same time, we've got to understand as a people of God and as a church that kids are kingdom builders as well. Kids go to schools, kids have activities, kids have friends. And when you start impressing that on their lives, they're going to start seeing what they see at home, hearing what they hear at home, and they're going to act upon it in public with kids whose parents do not know the Lord. Kids whose parents are probably in a terrible situation. They're going to be testimonies and witnesses of what they are seeing at home and at the church. You have no idea what the impact that they're going to have on God's kingdom. Number two, God uses children to grow us spiritually. There should be like a bunch of amens there, especially if you have kids, right? <laughs> God uses children to grow us spiritually. You know, I remember when I had Elena, I started understanding when I, when I studied the Bible better about God, about his wrath and about all these things. See, like, like why, Ricky, if God is so loving, why, why does he have wrath against sin? And, and then like when Elena was born, you know, I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I'm not like tough or like rough. But if you do something to my kid, I might like do something back. <laughs> I might do just enough to get maybe a year of jail time. <laughs> I mean, start a prison ministry. No, I'm like, so it's like, it's like Paul, no. But why do I say that? Because it's like, at first I was doing good, but when I held my baby in my arms for the first time, the love in my life escalated. It was this love I've never seen or felt before. It's, it's weird. It's, you just, it changes. You're like, man, if anybody does anything to you, I'm going to kill them. Right? Like, like you just, like, there's something in you. So the height 
The, the higher your love gets, the higher your wrath gets. And I'm like, God, sin, wrath. Like how he killed, like how, how Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He loved Jesus. Like for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But you also have to remember God's wrath through sin. The love of God is so strong. That's why wrath is present through sin. You see, all these things just start kind of coming together as a parent. You start seeing these things. So God uses children to help grow us spiritually and help us see his words. And I would even say help understand as God the Father more. And then also the last thing is children are not the future of the church, but they're the now of the church. You know, we kind of tend to, they're not just the future. They're also the now. And we kind of like want to put them back and say, hey, you know what? Let's like, well, let's wait for them to like grow up and mature. No, no, no. Like, we need to get them involved now. That's why it excites me. Like when I see stuff like that Jackson's doing with the shoes and like Elena now wants to help dim the lights. We see that as so like mediocre. But in my eyes, I'm like, yes, leadership. You're doing it. Yes, I want you to do that. <laughs> and that's why it's so important. I don't know if you guys understand this, but what happens with the kids in that room right there, man, like they teach them God's word. Everything that we're learning in this room, they're learning in that room too. It's not just games. It's not just entertainment. No, like we are trying to impress God's word on their lives as well. It's a partnership. It's a team thing. So I want to end with this verse. So then, Ricky, how do we do this? So you told us it's important for us to, to, to make sure that we train our children, that, that we give them the law of the Lord. But I, I want us to see something. How does this work? How do I raise my kid in this way? So we're just going to let one verse. Proverbs 22, verse 6. So go ahead and turn to that right there. It's so simple, yet so packed, <laughs> this verse. Proverbs 22, 6. So let's go ahead and find that here. It's right after the book of Psalms. Let me get that page number real quick. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah, there it goes. So we're on page 652. If you have your black Bibles, 652. So we just looked at the, sh the Shema, the, hey, people of God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. Take this, impress it on your kids, talk about it, be about it. It should be there all the time. When things happen, you always divert everything to God. They need to know that it's only God that's allowing all, like we gotta talk about the sovereignty of our Lord. But then how do we do this? Cause Ricky, some of y'all are looking like, Ricky, it's, it's better, it's easier said than done. You don't know my kid. <laughs> I was like, okay, well that's cool. Well the Bible kind of has a little bit, helps us to see this. Look what it says in verse 6. Start children on the way that they should go, and even where they are, I'm sorry, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. All right, so let's dissect this real quick because there's a better translation. So instead of start children off, the, the better translation, that word start actually means train up a child. Train up a child as he should go. You see, God wants us to train our children. AKA, you don't let them do whatever they want. That's terrible. Because if, if you don't control your children now, then they're gonna grow up and be out of control. So God is telling us in his word, train up a child in the way he should go. That means that you as a parent, you as a person of God to our children, you have the responsibility to discipline your child. You know, uh, Proverbs 13, 24, I'll just read it for time's sake. It says, if you love your child, you will discipline him quickly. It's important that we discipline our kids. And I love that word train. The word train in Hebrew means to narrow the path. It's, it's so interesting. It's like you narrow the path to your kid. You don't just let them do whatever. There is no negotiations when it comes to your child. Why this is so important. 
is because, and if you study the generations, if you study the generations, like Gen, Gen Xers, like Gen Xers don't want their kids to grow up like millennials. Millennials don't want their kids to grow up like boomers or Gen Xers. There's a shift in parenting where now it's about negotiations. Well, Dad, I don't want to go to church. Well, mijo, like, we'll give you a reward. If you go, it'll be fine. Can you, let, let's talk about this. Why don't you want to go to church? I want, I want like, let's, 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 let's stop in. You can stay. No, man. You are negotiating with a child. The answer is you're going. Get your butt in the car. Let's go. These are things that we as, as parents, as people of God, have got to understand that there's disciplines to this. I remember growing up, man, even my parents, and I never understood it until I'm older. They're like, man, you can go sleep over your friend's house. That's cool. And I'm in high school, man. They were like, here's the only thing. You have to be at church on Sunday, and you have to be awake. Ah, that's easy. I got this. So I would, of course, you don't sleep, man. Come on. We were playing NWO, WCW, 64 all night. Right? Listen to Third Eye Blind. Uh, yeah, just, just all that stuff. So then when it was time to go to church in the morning, you're sitting there and you're just like, don't close their eyes, don't fall asleep. You know, you're fighting and you're struggling. But you know what that did? That built this discipline in me that even in, when I was in college, regardless of how late I stayed up, regardless of any situation, I was in the Lord's house that Sunday. I, it, it built responsibility in my life. I used to play drums on the worship team back when I was in college. So I was like, I got to be able to do this. So I got to figure it out. I mean, there's things that, that are built in. That's why your parents have boundaries. So we are to give our kids boundaries, restrictions, and limitations. God is telling us that's how you train your child up. You are to instill these things in the life of your child. So that way, when they grow up, they will not depart from it. We got to establish these things. Then look what else Proverbs, I'm just going to spit, I'm just going to throw this out. So if you want to write it down, just for time's sake, Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. I did not teach Livy or Elena to be bad. You know what I mean? Like parents can know this. Like one day we're laughing and she just like hits me. <laughs> Where'd you learn that? <laughs> foolishness, I mean, we live in a broken world. We live in a sinful world. Right? The foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Proverbs 13, 24, love the child, you will discipline them quickly. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline, uh, um, discipline a child while there is hope and do not desire his death. Like what? <laughs> discipline your child, but don't be angry when you do it. Because you might kill him. <laughs> Some of your parents are like, yes. <laughs> discipline your child but man but you do it in love and you do it with the with the, the thought of like I am doing this because I love them I'm doing this because the Bible says to train them up I'm putting restrictions and perimeters and limitations on their lives so that way they know the Lord and then I love this because there's a promise that goes with this uh, in the way they should go so parents also have a, a responsibility to help their children with direction in the way they should go help them in direction so you want to make sure that there's restriction but then that restriction is to help point them in the direction in the way that they should go so as a parent you are trying to help your child focus on the purpose and the path that God has given them so you help lead them, you help guide them, you help encourage them in that way. So that way they're able to discern and to discover the path that God has for them. And he, here, here's why this is so important. You know, it's funny, I was talking to Emery about this uh, yesterday. It's like, because God uses every single life experience to prepare you for his purpose that he has for you. So as your kids are walking through life, you are giving them direction. You are telling them that's not a good idea. That's not a bad idea. There's a lot of uh, so you learn type moments. But you, if they fall, you're there to pick them up, dust them off. Let's keep moving in this direction. There's going to be heartbreak. There's going to be drama. There's going to be my friend said this. 
But those are all teachable moments that you as mom and dad and as uncles and aunts and as grandparents must use to point everything back to God and say, listen, that might not be the way that, that you wanted it, but God has something so much better for you. I know she broke your heart, but listen, she ain't it. <laughs> Come on, man. He's not all that. God has something better. I promise it's going to be okay. You don't have to like get sobby and all that stuff. It's going to be fine. You could throw away your Billie Eilish CD. I'm joking. I mean, there's some fans out here. So you are to give them that path. You are to help direct them. You know, something I see a lot of, especially working in high schools, there's a lot of kids that are graduating without direction. They don't know what to do. They don't know what's next. They don't, so they end up just kind of meandering through life. But you see, it's the parent's responsibility and role to help direct them and, and, and finding out God's purpose for their lives in every experience. And we spend so much time in educational endeavors, but we don't spend a lot, enough time in spiritual enrichment. Yes, education is important, but so is your spiritual life as well. That's where Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 kicks in. Because that's where the spiritual enrichment, you always talk about it, you show them, all that stuff kicks in. Because, yeah, education is important, but so is your spiritual nourishment. Kids need more than just one hour a Sunday for their spiritual lives. That's hard for us to understand. And a lot of us have the mentality is, I, I pay taxes, so the school's going to do that. I pay a tithe, so the church is going to do that. No, like, it's your responsibility. You understand that? It is up to you to raise your kids. Like, man, Rick, I don't want to send them to school. Like, no, like, it's your job to tell your kids, like, what they're doing is wrong. You must send them out. And then we'll end with this. Um, but before we kind of close up, we're actually going to do something. We're going to, like, bless our kids. They're going to come out here in a little bit. But we're going to spend some time just kind of praying over our kids, and we're going to bless them today as a church. So there is a promise that God gives us here. So it says, train your child in the way he should go. So train is the restriction. The way he should go is the direction. And then there's the encouragement. Because even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. I love that it, here it says he will not turn from it. You see that word abandon and turn? What it means, if, if you do some word studies here, it means it's like a fire you cannot put out. You can't turn it off. There's no off switch. How awesome is that? So if you train your child early, if, if you teach them the ways of God, by the time they're in their adolescent stage, by the time they're teenagers or in college, you're not going to be able to shut off the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't bow out. He doesn't say, oh man, he fell into sin. I'll forget it. I'll go somewhere else. No, like it stays with them. And listen, we all are going to mess up. Let, let me just help you right now. You're going to fail. We're all going to drop the ball. We're all going to jack it up. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to fall into sin sometime. But the difference here is, is that it will not get away from it. There's going to be something in them that says, man, this ain't right. There's going to be something in them that draws them back to God. Even when they fall off. Even when they fail. That's what you want to instill. So when he's old, he will not depart from it. We all have strayed, but there's something in us pulling us back. And that's what we want for our kids. We want that Holy Spirit in them. We want them to have a heart for the Lord. You can't turn it off if it's in them. You, they, you can't turn it off. There's no off switch. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty amazing. So before we uh, bring our kids out, we'll have a little time of worship. So I'm going to ask the guys to come up. And I just want to encourage us as a people of God and as a church, and if you don't have kids, that's, that's fine. But you have a church family with kids. You have family with kids. Some of you guys are grandparents. It's important. You have all these things that are important that you have got to understand that you play a vital role in all this.